Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Scholes. And today we have the third part in the tale of the brave little tailor. And, well, the tailor has escaped death at the hands of the giants, and he's about to head back out into the world and, well, face some new experiences, let's put it. This is part three of the brave little tailor. The tailor continued to follow his nose, and after he had wandered about for a long time, he came to the courtyard of a royal palace, and feeling tired, he lay down on the grass and fell asleep. While he lay there, the people came, and looking him all over, read on his girdle, seven at a blow. Oh, they said, what can this great hero of a hundred fights want in our peaceful land? He must indeed be a mighty man of valor. They went and told the king about him and said what a weighty and useful man he'd be in time of war, and that it would be well to secure him at any price. This counsel pleased the king, and he sent one of his courtiers down to the little tailor to offer him when he awoke a commission in their army. The messenger remained standing by the sleeper and waited till he stretched his limbs and opened his eyes, when he tendered his proposal. That's the very thing I came here for, he answered. I am quite ready to enter the king's service. So he was received with all honor and given a special house of his own to live in. But the other officers resented the success of the little tailor and wished him a thousand miles away. What's to come of it all? They asked each other. If we quarrel with him, he'll let out at us, and at every blow seven will fall. There'll soon be an end to us all. So they resolved to go in a body to the king and all send in their papers. We are not made said they, to hold out against a man who kills seven at a blow. The king was grieved at the thought of losing all his faithful servants for the sake of one man, and he wished heartily that he had never set eyes on him, or that he could get rid of him. But he didn't dare to send him away, for he feared he might kill him along with his people and place himself on the throne. He pondered long and deeply over the matter, and finally came to a conclusion. He sent to the tailor and told him that, Seeing what a great and warlike hero he was, he was about to make him an offer. In a certain wood of this kingdom there dwelt two giants who did much harm by the way they robbed, murdered, burnt, and plundered everything about them. No one could approach them without endangering his life. But if he could overcome and kill these two giants, he should have his only daughter for a wife, and half his kingdom into the bargain he might have a hundred horsemen too to back him up. That's the very thing for a man like me, thought the little tailor. One doesn't get the offer of a beautiful princess and half a kingdom every day. Done with you, he answered. I'll soon put an end to the giants, but I haven't the smallest need of your hundred horsemen. A fellow who can slay seven men at a blow need not be afraid of two. The little tailor set out, and the hundred horsemen followed him. When he came to the outskirts of the wood, he said to his followers, You wait here, I'll manage the giants by myself. And he went on into the wood, casting his sharp little eyes left and right about him. After a while, he spied the two giants sleeping under a tree, and snoring till the very boughs bent with the breeze. The little tailor lost no time in filling his wallet with stones, and then climbed up the tree under which they lay. When he got to about the middle of it, he slipped along a branch till he sat just above the sleepers, when he threw down one stone after the other on the nearest giant. The giant felt nothing for a long time, but at last he woke up, and pinching his companion said, What did you strike me for? I didn't strike you, said the other. You must be dreaming. They both lay down to sleep again, and the tailor threw down a stone on the second giant, who sprang up and cried, What's that for? Why did you throw something at me? I didn't throw anything, growled the first one. They wrangled on for a time, till as both were tired, they made up the matter and fell asleep again. The little tailor began his game once more and flung the largest stone he could find in his wallet with all his force and hit the first giant on the chest. This is too much of a good thing, he yelled, and springing up like a madman, he knocked his companion against the tree till he trembled. He gave, however, as good as he got, and they became so enraged that they tore up trees and beat each other with them till they both fell dead at once on the ground. Then the little tailor jumped down. It's a mercy, he said, that they didn't root up the tree on which I was perched, or I should have had to jump like a squirrel onto another, which 
though nimble as I am, would not have been so easy a job. He drew his sword and gave each of the giants a very fine thrust or two on the breast, and then went to the horsemen and said, The deed is done. I've put an end to the two of them, but I assure you it was no easy matter, for they even tore up trees in their struggle to defend themselves. But that's all of no use against one who slays seven men at a blow. Weren't you wounded? asked the horseman. No fear, answered the tailor. They haven't touched a hair in my head. But the horsemen wouldn't believe him till they rode into the wood and found the giants weltering in their blood, and the trees lying around, torn up by the roots. And that is part three of The Brave Little Tailor. The brave and cunning little tailor. Next week, we will share the end of this story and see how his arrangement with the king shakes out for the tailor. This is Dan Scholes for the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Threads and Instagram at Folktale Project. And you can find us wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. As always, thank you so much for listening.